As we continue, I guess my intro to the Easter series is this is a difficult thing to look at. Last week specifically, because I, I guess I drilled down on a micro level and we looked at some of the specifics of a Roman scourging and, and what actually, or scourging, and what actually happened, you know, in, uh, in that first century scene. This week, uh, just to save us all, I don't know whether we could go there again. What we're going to do is actually have a bit more of a macro look now as we look at what the, the cross of Jesus Christ means to us, means to our world today, what it meant then and what it means now. As I said, the Easter story can be difficult to look at. It's not that hard to understand. It's just that it is a very painful, difficult experience. The Son of God paid a tremendous price to win the freedom that we sing about today. Uh, so I want to read a scripture, John chapter 12. This is Jesus speaking, verse 31 through 33. And Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. This is Jesus leading up to the crucifixion. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. And John makes this footnote. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. It was obvious that in that culture, in that time, to say that I will be lifted up, it meant something to the people of the day. For us, it might not mean a lot, but for John recognised, he was speaking about Roman crucifixion. He was saying, this is what is about to happen next. And so I want to talk to us today, our theme through for the whole year is the kingdom is this, and, uh, and today the kingdom is the tale of two trees, the tale of two trees. If we look right back to the beginning of the creation, we, we see in a paradise-like place of Eden, two mysterious trees. There's a tree of life and there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know, it's okay to see that literally if you wanna see trees. But can I just say, if you're still arguing over whether the fruit was an apple, you might be missing the point that the ancient writer's trying to make. Uh, whenever I used to get involved in that argument, I always argued it was a mango because there's no way in the world I'd give my life up for, a, for an apple. But a mango, that could almost get me over the line. Uh, but that's not the point of the story, and it's an ancient story. It could be, if you look at it literally, it's a corny story. And if you look at it too literally, you will miss what the writer is saying. And in fact, maybe what all of Scripture is trying to teach us. So we're gonna, I'm going to look at three readings just to begin. The first, uh, and, and under this heading, the first section of this message is the first tree is a tree of death in the place of life. Genesis chapter 3 Verses three to five. But the fruit of the tree, this is God speaking to Adam and Eve. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, sorry, this is Eve speaking to Satan who was trying to tempt her. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Can I just make a quick observation? And that is, uh, God wasn't saying he would kill them. As much as often, that's the narrative that the church has presented. Eve just understood God had said, that's where death will begin for you. In verses four and five, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The next passage I wanna read is continuing on from uh, the whipping last week. Mark chapter 15 and I'm just going to paraphrase a bit of this so we can get through it. Is it okay if we read a bit of scripture at the beginning of the message? Stick with me. I'm sticking with my notes because, man, I've got to move. And it says in Mark chapter 15, And when they had mocked him, this is the crucifixion of Christ, they took the purple robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. There they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Galgotha, which is a Ch Chaldean Hebrew word, which is translated place of the skull. They took him literally to Skull Hill. 
Then they gave him wine mingled with murder drink, but he did not take it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. And with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand, the other on his left, so so that the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Skipping down a few verses. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the Jewish temple. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. One last passage I want to read us before we look into this. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. And Dr. Luke says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. So Luke calls the cross a tree. The apostle Paul does exactly the same in the book of Galatians. So if we go back now to the Genesis passage and begin to dig into this. Genesis 3.3 3, Eve was told, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. It seems strange. Of course, she was talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's the thought. Premature or the deadly nature of premature knowledge. Both trees in the garden were blessed by God, but the fruit of the second tree, eaten out of season, was poisonous. Again, if you get past the literal, there are principles here to grasp grasp, that somehow premature knowledge kills. And we understand this as much as we're bad at sticking to it. It's why, for example, we have an age of consent. We understand that there's some things that you're just not ready for. God looking at his own children, or any of us who are good parents understand that. I mean, for me, I think the age 16 is way too low. Our frontal cortex doesn't, prefrontal cortex doesn't develop, pop out our lobe. Our ability to weigh the pros and cons of decision making doesn't fully kick in until we're 25. So, I mean, sometimes that might work when getting a life partner. Might pay not to really think too hard about it. I don't know. But we understand premature knowledge is not always great and yet we live in a society and we live really, I, I think now for the last several thousand years ever since Greek culture, where we have come to believe the lie that knowledge is the answer. If we just knew everything, if we just knew, and, and of course knowledge is wonderful in certain spheres but there is a certain premature knowledge that can destroy us. Premature knowledge is a pathway to so much evil. We see it in our world. It's a pathway to radicalization to ideologies that are often violent ideologies. It's a pathway to uninformed political and social activism. If you've ever noticed, there's so many young faces in that space. It's a pathway to unhealthy worldviews shaped by internet exposure. It's a It's a pathway to social media supercharging identity issues from young girls' images to gender confusion. See, knowledge is not always the answer. It never was. Man has always thought it was, but it's not. As a matter of fact, thinking you know better than everyone else is the problem of our world. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant for the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Somehow they tried 
to cover their shame. And this is the entrance of fear and shame into the world. It's a tragic loss of innocence and simplicity of life. Adam and Eve were left in a world distant from the tree of life. And all that awaited them now was the spectre of death. And of course, we understand that really the first human death is recorded as Cain kills his brother Abel. I just, again, want us to note, as much as preachers for many years have been trying to make God the angel of death, death came by the hand of man. This is repeated just a few short generations later when one of Cain's grandsons or great-grandsons goes out and he founds a city. So Cain goes out and founds a city. Then his son Lamech goes out and what the scripture says about him is that he kills a young man for offending him and then he founds a city in that place. Again, not being too literal, think about what the writer is saying and some of the principles that we can understand from this. Number one, the judgment of death came from the hand of man <laughs> and, and preachers have mistakenly often put that back in the hands of God and I have to say, I am one of them. Cities and the foundation of civilization as we know it have always been marked by the blood of the innocent. This is actually the problem of man. This is the problem of sin and evil. Have you ever wondered why God puts a mark on Cain after he kills his brother so no one would kill him? It's a bit like, well, doesn't he deserve it? Actually, I think God knew. That's exactly how people would respond. He killed someone, let's kill him. And right there you see God trying to circumvent the myth of redemptive violence. That somehow by us retaliating violently, we can fix something that's violent. Just point to anywhere in the world where that's worked, folks, and I'll believe you. And here we see it right back in these ancient scriptures. God somehow trying to save us from what could become a bigger future problem. That's the first tree. And all of Scripture happens between these trees. Or all of, not all of Scripture, but all of the redemptive story. Everything God does is between these two trees. This is the space we live, between two trees. There's this tree of human reasoning and our understanding, and we know best. And then there is a tree of life that was actually lost at Eden. Let's look at the second tree. The second tree is a tree of life in the place of death. First tree is a tree of death in the place of life. The second tree is a tree of life in a place of death. The cross is the focal point of scripture, the fulcrum on which the whole story turns. It really is the tale of two trees. Here's the stunning truth. I'm going to read Isaiah 53, verse 12, and it'll be familiar because I just read it, but I read Mark quoting it in the crucifixion passage. Isaiah 53, verse 12, 600 years before Christ, Isaiah said, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, Isaiah's not saying he was a transgressor. He was saying that's who he had identified with when he died cross and a, a thief on either side and again you see this kind of juxtaposition you have one thief repentant and one unrepentant it's like Christ is stretching out between the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and of death and stretching out one hand to the other is the tree of life offering a thief a last minute reprieve Christ identifies with us we all live in a world that war hath forged. Cain inaugurated the pattern that all civilizations were to follow, what the Bible cryptically calls Babylon, typifying the kingdoms of mankind. Brian Zahn is a phenomenal, phenomenal writer if you ever read any of his work. And I just want to quote what he says in one of his recent books. Cain's fratricidal DNA is found in the genetics of every earthly kingdom no matter how primitive it might be or how advanced. Call your brother other. Tell yourself it must be done. Slay your ables. Hide the bodies. Lie to yourself and God. 
and unwittingly we move further away from Eden. If you look at the spread of mankind after the fall, it's continuously moving eastward away from the garden. My thought is we rinse and repeat that for thousands of years and here we are in 2024 worrying about the fractured world our children and grandchildren will inhabit. But into this scene comes the one who turns the other cheek, comes the one who lays his life down for his friends, comes the one who spreads his arms on a cruel Roman cross and absorbs the violence and the ridicule and the mocking and the scorn and the pain and the betrayal that has destroyed the human race from the very beginning. He takes it on himself willingly. And in doing so, he inaugurates another kingdom, something that is not of this world. So I want to contrast a couple of scriptures here. Return back to Genesis 3. You doing okay? I know this is very informational, but I just want to get this across clear. Is that okay? Doing all right? I mean, to tell jokes later, I can do that, but I want to preach first. Is that okay? Okay. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Going back to the fall, and this is talking about God. It says, he drove out the man and he placed cherubim, or a particular kind of angel, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And you might say, well, why would God do that? Because man would live in an eternally fallen state. Just imagine if Hitler or Stalin never died. We wouldn't have even got to the 40s. You don't really need to worry about that. None of us would probably exist. I've got, a, I've got the feeling, my conviction is, why the flood? Because man would have extincted himself. Scripture records that at that point, every thought of the human heart was only evil continuously. So we live in a world that has been redeemed by the grace of God. Amazingly, amazingly, God is working. God's at work. It's getting better, folks. It's actually getting better. As much as it can look dark at times and as much as there could be stuff where you think, wow, I don't know how we got there, it's actually a lot better than it has been in the past when you look into the past and you don't have to look far. So they are held out from the tree of life and then Mark records, as we wrote, read, that when Jesus gave up his spirit, when he died on that cross, it says that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And of course, the veil in the Jewish temple, it, it really was to, in a sense, mask the presence of God. It was like God is too holy for you to be near the presence of God. So we have this massive curtain veil that was several thicknesses thick, and, uh, and it, keeps the pres- it keeps us safe from an angry God. And it keeps God safe from unholy people being anywhere near God. We've got to keep a separation. And yet on the cross it says that, t- that veil was torn from top to bottom. And what it signifies is that the presence of God is with man. That's what... It, The people of the day might have put a veil up, but that was not God's intent. His desire has always been to be with his people. Come and think about it. When we were created, we were breathed into. We're we're nothing but inspired dust, inspired dirt. God has never had a problem with dirt. He makes people out of it. And so now the veil is torn. The presence of God is with people. God has made it so, so clear. And really... What has happened ultimately is that the tree of life on that day was replanted. Access to the tree of life is now available to everyone. Everything happens between the trees. In a world of death and struggle, we have a message and that is that the tree of life has been found. Once again, come on, it's amongst humankind. The eternal tree first planted by God in paradise and then lost to the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve when the gates of Eden closed has been found. But this time, the tree of life was not planted in paradise. It was planted upon a skull-like hill, a, a place where death had ruled, a hill called Golgotha. 
And if you think of the cross, the cross is an ugly tree. It's only got two branches. It was purposeful. It was a killing tree. Its fruit was death for all who hung upon it. Golgotha's tree embraced men and released them. Only once life had gone from them. But what we note with Jesus is crucifixion can extinguish the life of those who are already dead in their sin and their trespass. But this is no mere son of Adam. This is the son of the living God. Jesus of Nazareth. New Testament calls him the new Adam or the second Adam, the way, the truth, the life. 1 Corinthians 15 says, So it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam, or Christ, became a life-giving spirit. And so on the cross, what we see on this second tree is the Son of God entering the world of the dead and dying children of Adam and Eve, but possessing the spirit of life within him. And then as Leviticus says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. As Jesus' blood stained the wood on Skull Hill, it became not just a dead tool of execution, but it became the tree of life for anyone who would cling to it. We just heard brilliant testimonies this morning, a couple of young people that have just found themselves at the foot of Jesus Christ. And I mean, I didn't line this up to preach this with that. I was just thrilled to hear those testimonies. But, but as I think about it, you have heard the testimony of two young people who've just had an experience. What is it like to come to the tree of life, out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the struggle where I'll make everything happen by my own smarts, and I will trust my own intellect, and I will trust this world built by the kingdoms of men, and then finding yourself at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, and all you can talk about is life. Anyone else here been surprised? Like I came to Jesus, I think I was scared of hell. I'd sat around too many preachers that believed God was the killer. But to tell you the truth, I got the surprise of my life when I actually gave my life to Christ that this was about life. It wasn't so much even about escaping death. It was just about life. You know, come to me and I will give you. So this is the second tree. What was lost behind the closed gates of Eden has now been found. Our long exile east of Eden is over. And now we can return home. We can get back to that place we're always meant to be. John metaphorically describes heaven as a city. In Revelation he says, Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. So the imagery, imagery of the New Testament writer is that actually that paradisical experience of Eden is available to us now where we walk with God in the cool of the afternoon just as Adam did where we actually go back to a place without shame and without fear and, and before the myth of redemptive violence, which, by the way, comes out in all kinds of forms, not just out of the end of the barrel of a gun, but it comes out our mouths. And there is a different way to live. You can either live your life by your own smarts and the smarts of this world and what the Kingdoms of this, men, of, the, of this world, the kingdoms of men founded in blood tell you how you've got to act and behave. Or you come to the tree of life. And the beauty with the tree of life, you don't have to be smart to embrace it. As a matter of fact, the New Testament says, Paul says to the church, don't take this as discouragement, but this is, just, this is the Bible, folks, I've got to say it. He says to the church, look around you. you know, there's not many high and mighty. There's not many nobles. There's not many who this world would consider cream of the crop. But it's just humble people that work out somehow, I'm just sick of the struggle. And I'm sick of the stuff of this world. It, 
It doesn't satisfy no matter how much I get of it. It's not scratching that itch. It's not filling that hole in my heart. There has to be more. And it's that humble faith. If that drives us to reach out and take hold of the tree of life for ourselves, if that causes us to reach out and put our hands in the life of the resurrected Christ, then Paul says, actually, the wisdom of God has confounded the wisdom of this age. Knowledge. What do we say in our world? Knowledge is power. Scripture reveals God as love. So knowledge isn't power. Love is where the source of all life flows from. So let me ask us a a few questions. I've got more scripture there, but I'm sweetly out of time. I've actually done right pretty well today. So proud of me. Uh, That's because it's wet outside and the children can't go to the playground. So, and I don't want to be assaulted by our kids' workers believing in the myth of redemptive violence when I leave the the room. (laughs) Here's some questions. I I hope hope we're not tired of the question thing we do. I, I just think it's such a brilliant way for us to actually apply the message. How will this look in my life this week? It's, it's just fine to get some sort of a story and I don't even know how that, whether that was clear or not. I was trying to paint a bit of a picture. But, but ultimately, I think just a few questions that help us to still down. What do we do about this today? How does that affect my life tomorrow, Monday, when I walk onto a walk, workshop floor or I walk into my school or I walk through the university gates? or I walk into a boardroom or a business meeting or wherever it is, I, I, I walk down the path into the hospital. First question I'd ask is, have you ever been burned by premature experiences? Maybe at the time you were just longing to break free from restraint, but now you recognise the only thing that was breaking was innocence. Can I just encourage you? There is a hope of restoration. There is a hope of restoration. I, I just love the fact that God takes us how we are, meets us where we're at, loves us in spite of us, but then loves us too much. To leave us there is determined to walk with us into a better space. The scripture would say again and again and again, describes it as a broad place. God wants to bring your feet into a broad place. And I hear those baptism testimonies. I'm like, I'm just sitting there thinking that's exactly my experience. 38 years, 39 years ago, that was exactly my experience. All of a sudden, I just realized I'd like come out of the cave and I could just see the world a whole heap clearer. What about you? Jesus does do-overs. Another question is, are you willing to identify with the new way of life Christ is offering us all, even as he was willing to identify with any guilt and shame that you may bear? That's the exchange of the cross. Living out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we all do from a small age, from a young age, we're crafted in it. Living out of that covers us in fear and shame. Jesus was quite happy to hang naked on a cross and face a tortuous death and bear the fear and the shame so that you could come to the tree of life and walk away free of fear and shame. Are you willing to identify with him? And, and I say that word identify because I guess in one sense, it's a, it's a trigger word or it's a, it's a word today in our vocabulary that's very prominent. And by saying that, I think there's a good element, there's a good application to it. Being a Christian is not believing the right things as much as identifying with the person of Jesus Christ. It's good to believe the right things. I'm not knocking that. But if if that's all you think Christianity is, it's just a head knowledge. It's just knowledge. You're back at the tree of knowledge. (laughs) Rather than, man, I want to live the way my Saviour lived. 
I might not know all the scriptures. I might not know everything about God. I might not know any theology. But if I just do a cursory reading of the New Testament, I can see how Jesus lived and treated people. And that's been enough for multiplied millions of Christians through the ages. Last question. Will you come to the tree of life and forsake the tree of knowledge? Will you stop trusting your own emotions or sorry, your own opinions and emotions, your own opinions and calculations and release your whole heart in faith with the determination to follow Jesus? And can I just say, I'm not ruling anyone in the room out from that question. That's not just a question for new people. That's for us. I think of it this way, often we have said, and and it's true, Scripture says the mercies of God are new every morning. Every day is the potential to start afresh. I think that's why we love God. I mean, if that wasn't the case, most of us would no longer be here. We would have felt like we'd washed out, but every time we feel like we've washed out, we suddenly encounter the grace and goodness and love of God again and think, wow, God's not finished with me yet. Would there be anyone game to raise a hand and go, oh, I thought God was finished me at some point? One person, so I feel really good. I'm in good company. (laughs) I think as well as the mercies in you every morning, so is a compelling call by Christ to say, come follow me. Oh, Lord, but I followed you yesterday. Wasn't that good? No. (laughs) Come follow me. My mercy's new every morning and my call to live differently in the world is new every morning. To to walk away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and continuously committing ourselves to the tree of life. Lord, my trust is in you. I don't understand it all, but I actually don't need to. That's why we call it faith. If you're still arguing with bad faith, you're still at the tree of knowledge. You're still living at the wrong tree. And you need to move towards the tree of life. So I'd love to pray for us today. Is that okay? And we'll close. You good? You okay? Have a think about those questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're doing in the earth, what you've done in the earth. Some of us have been on this journey for a while. Some of us are brand new to it. Some of us may not have begun to migrate from one tree to the next. But Father, in your presence today, I just pray that what has been shared, and particularly scripture that has been shared, I just pray that we've seen something today. Maybe we've plotted where we are on a trajectory between the trees. So Father, help us, help us when it comes to surrendering and identifying with you, passing off old hurts, old pains, old shame, old guilt, whatever might be trying to trap us in the past. We thank you that Jesus identified with us and he carried it all. Those of us who've been wounded, Lord, by premature knowledge, premature experiences, things we really weren't mature enough or ready for. Lord, we just want to surrender those to you. Move away from the deadly fruit of premature knowledge and move towards the tree of life. We thank you for for, for forgiveness, Lord, for each and every one of us, if we need it, Lord, just right now, it's there. Friend, just reach out. God loves you. God affirms you. God wants to draw you back into divine purpose for your life. And maybe a few of us do need to really embrace the tree of life afresh. And maybe things have just gotten stale or tired. Maybe we've got some grave clothes we've picked up along the way that we just have to throw off and embrace the tree of life again. I just think it's a perfect opportunity. Just be terrible to come 
to a church meeting, to, to have a service, to come together, worship God, and our hearts not be searched and us not respond in some way. And I just encourage you, just right where you are, just respond to God in your own way. While the heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Now, you could be here, maybe you've never taken hold of the tree of life, ever. Like this is maybe a first for you. Maybe the first time you've ever been given the opportunity to really intentionally place your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did so long ago that continues to change lives to this day. Friend, I want to give you that opportunity. Just right now in your heart of hearts, if you'd say to me, Chris, I need Jesus in my life. If that's you, just, just do it. Tell Jesus. Don't need to tell me. Tell him. And friend, if you're, if you're authentic, he will show up in your world. So just open your heart just right where you are. Right where you are. After the service, we'll have some people out there with, at a table with Bibles and stuff. And we want to empower your journey. And I think that would be a great step for you. If you're here saying, I want to begin to follow Jesus, go grab a copy of, the, of Scripture on us. It's free. Um, have a chat to the, the people there and tell, tell them what you've done or where your heart's at. And let them encourage you on your journey. Next week, Resurrection Sunday. <laughs>